Welcome, everybody. My name is Jennifer Griffith, and I work at the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association. I've got the um, NMOA website up, uh, and Laurent, you can see it, and you can hear me? Yes, I can. Good, good afternoon. Great. So, um, so just for a little bit of background, NMOA is an interstate association of the six New England states. Uh, New York and New Jersey, so the eight Northeast states. We were formed by the governors of the New England states back in the 80s, and uh, it includes the solid waste programs, the waste like um, the hazardous waste programs, the toxics in products programs, pollution prevention, but then also the waste like cleanup programs um, of those eight states participate through NMOA, and their priority for NMOA is to uh, share information with each other and then also training, training of their staff. And then we uh, typically open up our training to, um, to everybody. So uh, we, in the pre-COVID times, we would hold uh, in-person workshops, uh, but we also hold webinars. Um, we've done a whole series of webinars, several series over the course of the last couple of years on FAST. But um, our states also have other priorities besides that, and wanted, um, because we can't have in-person workshops, wanted NAMOA to organize some, uh, some webinars. So that is what we are doing here today. Uh, vapor intrusion is always a topic of concern, and um, it's good to have a refresher for, for uh, older staff, but also um, some of the states have been fortunate to be able to hire some new staff. So uh, we're having this webinar today to talk about assessment, and then we will be doing another webinar uh, next week on Thursday next week that's focused more on mitigation. Um, so hopefully you can join that one as well. So website up here because we are going to post the presentations from today on the NMO website, and I'll just show you where. So here's our basic website, namoa.org. We come over here. Our website is, I think, was designed in the 1990s, um, and we are definitely a low-budget <laughs> organization, so have not been able to upgrade. But um, you, it still works. You come over to Wayside Cleanup, and then you pick events, and then here are some upcoming events, which also includes today's webinar here, um, as well as all our past events. So we've done a lot of uh, training, um, held a lot of webinars and workshops on different topics over the course of time, and we always post the presentations. So you can find uh, the presentations on a lot of different topics uh, here if you want uh, to, you know, keep scrolling down. They kind of go backwards in time. So um, but we've done um, lots of different uh, topics. So you will be able to find the slides here on the NMO website after the webinar, um, well, within a few days <laughs> of the webinar. So um, again, welcome to everybody. We've got folks uh, on the webinar today from all across the country, which is great. Uh, and so because of the number of attendees, we will not be able to deal with questions um, verbally. So everybody will stay muted and you can just use the um, question uh, feature in your control panel uh, for GoToWebinar. It should be um, sort of in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, there's a question feature, and you can type in your questions at any point. Uh, we'll have each presenter will present, uh, and then after their presentation, we will uh, spend some time for questions. Then we'll have the second presentation, and then do questions again. So again, you can type in questions at any point. Um, I think that is all the logistics that I have. Um, so I will introduce and, and turn the screen over to our first presenter, which is going to be uh, Laurent Levy. He is a senior technologist at Jacob. His primary role is to develop client uh, site strategies and cleanup solutions within Jacob's vapor intrusion practice. Laurent has over 15 years of experience working with industrial clients, attorneys, and regulators on a variety of topics, 
including vapor intrusion investigations and risk assessment. Subsurface environmental investigations and cleanup, contaminant fate and transport studies, and environmental litigation support. Laurent holds his undergraduate degree from Ecole Centrale Paris. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, um, which is school lo which is located in Paris, um, as well as a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's also a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts. So let's see, we see uh, your screen. So um, you can I ask which screen you're seeing? Do you see the small screen with all the icons or do you see this screen with the presentation? The with all the icons and the mm, I need to change. I need to figure it out. There you go. Can there you see we the go. presentation now? Yes, we do. So all right. great. So with this that. Go ahead. Laurent. Can you see the the red uh, button here? Yes. That's moving. Yes, I see Perfect. The red. Okay. Then yes. I have everything I need. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and good morning if you are on a time zone that is further to the west. I am Laurent Levy. I work for Jacobs. Um, I report to the Boston office in Massachusetts, uh, but I don't. Even before COVID, I was not going there much. I lived in Western Massachusetts in a, a very nice city called Northampton. Uh, right behind me on this photo is the Quabbin Reservoir, which is about 15 miles east of here uh, that supplies water to Boston. Very, very nice and peaceful place. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about vapor intrusion guidance document. Um, on my spare time, I keep track of guidance of present document, but also past documents. And I put all of those documents on uh, a website, which I nicknamed the Vapor Intrusion Blog. If you take a Google window, uh, can you see the Google window, Jennifer? Yes, I can. Perfect. Yep, we see what's on if your you screen. Type, if you <laughs> type Vapor Intrusion Blog um, and uh, click, you should see it. Unfortunately, I'm unable to do it now because I have that. There we go. If you click here, it will show up. It's the first link. And um, it's not super organized, not completely up to date, but certainly if you're looking for all guidance, I tend to uh, I tend to find them and, and keep track of them. So if for some reason you need the 2012 guidance of Alaska, currently they are 2017 you will be able to find it on this on this blog. And that can come back to, to useful when you have a, a litigation case when you need to figure out what was done and when. Um, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit more about what is vapor intrusion and I will move on to guidance. Um, I'm taking the uh, the definition of EPA in their final guidance, it's the vapor intrusion is the migration of hazardous vapors from any subsurface vapor source, such as contaminated soil or groundwater through the soil and into an overlying building of structure. So essentially, you have vapors. It comes from either uh, the release itself or from groundwater that's off-gassing, and it makes its way into an occupied structure. There are five conditions. Uh, for a vapor intrusion pathway to be complete, a source of chemicals, a route along which the vapors can migrate, such as the vapor zone, uh, the, the, the VEDO zone, building susceptibility to vapor entry, some cracks, for example, of some uh, utility penetration, and the presence of the chemicals in indoor air. And finally, it has to be occupied. Note here that uh, that condition is not uh, that the, the it doesn't have to be that doesn't need to be an exceedance of screening level for a vapor intrusion pathway to be complete it's not part of the condition so you could have a vapor intrusion pathway that is complete but not significant if the you know, screening levels are not exceeded in indoor air why is it a concern? Well, there are long-term concern, uh, cancer risks, for example, associated with exposure, long-term exposure to some VOCs. And more recently, in the past 10 years, some concern, uh, and it remains still a controversial issue, some concern have, uh, are associated with TCE, 
uh, short-term concerns, and we'll tell you we'll tell you a little bit more about this later. But because it's a short term, it, it concerns a small exposure window during pregnancy, uh, it, it can be very technically challenging to address. Common chemical driving VI concern, TCE, which we just mentioned with the short term effects, TCE, T is in Patrick, common dry cleaning fluid, and finally benzene, uh, which is a gasoline constituent. There are obviously others, but these are the ones that are most common. So you probably know that it's a fairly complicated process. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of the difficulty has to do with the spatial and temporal variability. You come one day, measure some concentration in indoor air, it's a one, it's one value, and come back several months later, it's a very different value. And um, a lot of it has to do with uh, fairly various process that controls that control the, the, the vapor uh, migration into the building. You start with a release. Uh, VOCs are either traveling to the structure uh, from of gassing from groundwater, or they it can be horizontal travel uh, from uh, from a source release. Vapor usually travel in the vado zone through diffusion close to the structure. They will migrate into the structure through advective uh, uh, processes, difference in pressure between the outside and the inside, or sometimes diffusion also, and um, once uh, they are in the building, the concentration in indoor air will depend on two things. The amount of sol gas entry, how much gas is coming to the structure, and the amount of building air exchange. The more air exchange in the building, the more dilution of that sol gas and the lower the concentration. So it's a game between sol gas entry and building air exchange, which you will hear very often um, on those topics. So what does influence vapor intrusion? Well, you may have heard about the term stack effect. Stack effect is particularly in the winter, the fact that there's a large difference in temperature between the inside of the building and the outside. The heat rises, and as a result of that uh, heat rises, you create depressurization around the lowest level of your building. You can have other effects uh, that control uh, other weather effects. Uh, differential temperature is one. Uh, but you can also have some effects related to barometric pressure, wind speed, and some precipitation. And sometimes it's not a low barometric pressure as much as a sudden change of barometric pressure, which will result in additional vapor intrusion. So it is pretty confounding um, because what complicates vapor intrusion is just uh, it, it doesn't take vapor intrusion to have certain certain chemicals in indoor air. Benzene, PC, and to some extent TCE are, can be present in indoor air just because of uh, various products in the house, adhesives, dry clean clothing, car trucks on the outside, cleaning products. If you have gun cleaner, that 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 get gun cleaner can contain TCE. If you have brake cleaning spray, it can contain PCE. Uh, this is an example of glue. I took that photo at a craft store, E6000, does contain some, some PCE. And more recently, we're starting to see others. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous article about a, a Christmas tree decoration that was found to emit 1,2 DCA inside a home. So you have to bear this in mind. I'm at a cis 1,2 cis DCE here. As you may know, cis 1,2 dichloroethylene is a common breakdown product of PC and TC. This is one chemical that tend not to be present in background. So when you see it in indoor air, it is a pretty good indication that vapor intrusion may be occurring. Two things to consider. Uh, Atypical pathway and conventional pathway. When we refer to a conventional pathway, to some extent, every vapor intrusion is a result of a, of a preferential pathway. But what we refer to conventional pathway is emission of vapor through floor cracks in the basement. And by contrast, we talk about atypical preferential pathway when the vapors come uh, through sewer lines, vaults, utility penetration, and uh, so here are a couple examples on photographs. And when this happens, when vapor, for example, come through uh, uh, sewer systems, you have to be mindful uh, when using 
uh, screening level, soil gas screening levels, because those numbers, those concentration can be low, below the screening level, and yet you have vapor intrusion occurring in the building. So you have to be typically subslab soil gas screening level will not apply in cases of atypical preferential pathway. Another things to consider are um, petroleum vapor intrusion. By now, many states are aware that petroleum uh, VOCs, such as uh, fuel, fuel gasoline related compounds, are less prone to, to result in VI issue because of the aerobic biodegradation that can occur in the VEDO zone. Um, by now, most states tend to provide some guidelines uh, when, when VI is related to petroleum compounds. If you, for example, when you have a, a benzene or other uh, petroleum compounds, plumes, but, but not chlorinated, chlorinated VOCs, to the extent that you have six feet of separation between the plume and the structure, you do not have to conduct investigation. Uh, some states use six feet, some states use five feet, it's depending on the guidance that, that they prefer. Uh, if you have LNAPL, that vertical separation distance becomes 15 feet or 18 feet, according to uh, ITRC. A number of states have this, many of the member states for New Moa have that, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Maine have some consideration related to uh, petroleum uh, vapor intrusion. New Hampshire, I didn't see it, but they do incorporate additional uh, additional dilution in their in their attenuation factor for for this type of compounds. So here's a brief history of vapor inclusion guidance over the past uh, 20 plus years. The concern associated with vapor intrusion of VOC dates back to the mid to late 90s, uh, with a number of states ahead. Uh, I believe Massachusetts was one of them. Uh, during the 2000s is the, the, the decade during which uh, a number of guidance documents are issued. The, for example, the draft EPA in 202, the ITRC uh, guidance in 2007, many states have published during that decade. Um, as the 2010 came, um, a number of modification appeared, uh, petroleum vapor intrusion started to to appear, ITRC and later uh, uh, EPA published guidance, many states published guidance. The short-term uh, concern associated with TCE started to pop up. Uh, the PC toxicity started to change. It went up uh, except for a number of states based on a disagreement over what the endpoint should be. Um, and many states decided to update their guidance at that time to, to, to take all those new, new things that we find out about in, in, into consideration. As the late, uh, as the 2010 came to a close, there was a little bit more concern about PFAS and PFO and vapor intrusion went a bit, a bit on the back burner, uh, but it's still pretty active. Here, uh, what I think will be an issue coming in the in the next decade, uh, there'll be probably more guidance about mitigation. It's still not not all states provide guidance on mitigation. Uh, ITRC will be releasing fact sheets at the end of the year. Um, there will be, I believe, changes in attenuation factor for commercial industrial buildings, and I'll say a few things about this. Uh, there'll be continued debate about short-term TCE. Um, I think we'll, we'll see more real-time monitoring uh, and, and perhaps less canister uh, to address in particular the short-term TC concern. And uh, we will see more development of indicators, tracers, and surrogates, uh, including using radon as a tracer to monitor uh, when, when to sample and, and when concentration are high enough that we, we should be sampling for, for VOC in indoor air. So here is the uh, a map of state guidance as of this month. Um, I should preface this by saying that what constitute guidance uh, is subject to uh, a lot of interpretation. Um, um, by now, most states, there are only two states, North Dakota and, and Arkansas, where I could not find anything about VI. Other states, have either standalone or draft guidance, about 30 states by now, or some additional uh, consideration 
either within a broad program. So for Illinois, it's the uh, TACO program. For Louisiana, it's the, uh, the RECAP program and, and so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes it, it, it is part of UST cleanup program like Utah or, or Kentucky, if I remember. Um, so what constitute guidance is subject to imputation. Georgia, for example, has a guidance, but it's simply a website and that website page is called Vapor Intrusion Guidance. So that, that counts. Oklahoma has one fact sheet uh, with some consideration that essentially say, you know, look, this is what vapor intrusion is, look up the EPA guidance. Texas, subject to debate, they do have some indoor air screening, they do talk about vapor intrusion, but some people consider it's not really vapor intrusion guidance. So there are, you know, some, some guidance are fairly prescriptive, uh, some other guidance and tend to defer a little bit to EPA. Other guidance will we'll talk about, you know, typical operating procedure for sampling, what to do for mitigation and so on. By now, many states have updated their guidance. California is in the process of unifying DTSC and, and the San Francisco Water Board guidance into one document. Michigan has issued, uh, has provided one page in 2020 to update their guidance. New Hampshire is a sandwich. It's got the 2006 on top of, no, 2013 on top of the 2011 on top of the 26 guidance. New York has added one page. Ohio has changed everything. Wisconsin has uh, also created a, a, a more recent guidance. Oregon has simply one paragraph on the 2010 guidance saying, hey, things, things are brewing. Uh, contact us uh, for complicated cases. Uh, but they, they have not quite updated the 2010 guidance. Um, you do see also some uh, disappearing uh, eternal draft guidance. Uh, uh, Washington has had a draft since 2009, uh, which they are uh, in the process of updating and they've generated a lot of documents, questions about the 2009 guidance, consideration about short-term TC and so on. Typical assessment mitigation process, it's a fairly, it's, you, there are obviously some difference, but it's often common, a, a, a common approach. You start with assessing uh, the potential presence of the VI pathway. You review uh, the conceptual site model. You will compare uh, groundwater concentration to volatilization screening levels. And if these are exceeded and they are structured within the a, a lateral or vertical separation distance from the plume, you, you, you need to, to conduct some investigation into these buildings. And again, most states tend to have consideration for atypical preferential pathways. Then you conduct via investigation, the number of samples, sampling event to the sampling timing will vary from location to location. Commonly, you are expected to collect subslab soil gas, indoor air and outdoor air sample. Nowadays, we tend to do these more or less at the same time. Uh, interestingly, the number of sampling in a, in a given structure can, can vary significantly from one place to another. Here's an example of calculation from New Jersey and Michigan. Uh, if you have a 50,000, so that's quite a, a large commercial building here. If you have a 50,000 in one square feet structure, New Jersey will expect eight sample and Michigan will expect 25. So that can be, uh, that can change quite a bit from one state to the other. Once you have collected the samples, uh, you will compare these to, typically compare these to screening levels and on the basis of the results, you will determine next step, either no further action, additional assessment, uh, background search, rapid response if you have exceedance for TCE or, or mitigation in a long-term management plan. And importantly, make sure to uh, uh, take care of public, do some public outreach at every step, not just at the onset of the investigation, but early on to inform uh, the public of, or, or the occupants of a building of, of uh, the findings and, and the potential concerns. So I've mentioned indoor air screening levels. What is very puzzling, uh, but not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying there's a value that's wrong and a value that's right, but in general, we find very different screening level from one state to the other. These can have different meanings. 
what one stake will call screening level can be a, a, a target level for another. So we have to be uh, careful about what the screening levels mean. Generally, the screening levels are based on either health-based criteria, 10 minus 5, 10 minus 6 cancer risk, or index hazard of varying degree, 0.1 to 1 for, for the non-cancer risk. Sometimes they're based on background level studies, Massachusetts is an example, New York, so on. Sometimes based on the TO15 summa canister reporting limits. Um, the screening level are also affected by the duration. Most states use 26 years like EPA, but some say goes as high as 70 years, uh, Vermont, for example. And also particularly for PC, not all states agree with EPA and decide to use their own approach. Uh, in California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Vermont are states that do not use EPA's approach to PC toxicity. So here's an example of residential screening level. I'm just gonna look at TCE. Uh, the range of value for TCE goes from about 0.2 microgram cubic meter in indoor air for New York, all the way to 59 uh, for, for Louisiana, uh, which is, uh, uh, about two orders of magnitude. Many states tend to be near the 2.1, which is the non-cancer uh, cancer risk of, of with an index hazard of one. Uh, and then you have a number of states that are either using a fraction of that non-cancer risk or the 10 and minus cancer risk. So you have a value of 0.4. And then you have the low states that are user using the 0.1 of the index hazard or, or some special, some special uh, number that they derive in house. So from the indoor air, you move to the subslab soil gas through the use of generic attenuation factor. Uh, here's an example for three states. Massachusetts starts with, this is for, for PCE. Uh, Massachusetts use 1.4 for the indoor air screening level. They apply uh, their own attenuation factor, which is 0.014 to come up with 98 as a subslab soil gas screening level. New Hampshire does something slightly different. They get a greater number and Vermont tends to get uh, a low number because they're using, they start from a, a, a low indoor air screening level and they apply the uh, EPA default uh, generic attenuation factor of 0.03 to get that value of 21. So again, if you have a higher uh, attenuation factor, that assume that you have a um, less attenuation. So the smaller the number, the more attenuation is assumed. Most states tend to use EPA, the value of 0.03, uh, consistent with their guidance, um, but um, that, that varies. And again, as I pointed out, subslab soil gas and indoor uh, simultaneously simultaneous sampling tends to be the expectation now. As you probably know, um, Commercial uh, industrial settings tend to be much larger building. There is an implicit assumption that there would be more attenuation and therefore that we could use, assume more attenuation, therefore use a lower attenuation factor for subslab soil gas in those buildings. Uh, however, not many states do it. Only uh, these four, as far as I can tell, uh, assume more attenuation for large building, about, about three times more. Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, Wisconsin, all assume about three times more attenuation uh, relative to non-residential setting. But most states do not. They still default with the 0.03 or their own value for both uh, commercial and residential settings. Uh, EPA recognized there could be more attenuation, but they, they, don't, uh, they don't make any uh, change about the default value. So I'm gonna put my salesman hat uh, and, and want to show you some data that uh, we've, we've collected, uh, work that we've done for Jacobs, where we analyzed the data set of industrial and commercial buildings uh, for the Department of Defense, uh, various DOD installation. And each dot that you see here is uh, a concentration uh, of indoor air as a function of the subslab. So one point represent uh, a given sampling zone in the building on the average. Uh, for, we filtered the data to eliminate background effects. We used the same approach as EPA in their uh, vapor intrusion database. 
and not a single data point uh, exceed this attenuation of 0.03 defined by the default value of EPA. In fact, most buildings show an attenuation factor of uh, 10 to minus three, or, or we'll assume more attenuation than this. So we would recommend for this large commercial industrial building, a generic attenuation factor of 10 to minus three, which is even more attenuation than what Wisconsin and North Carolina recommend for this type of settings. And we'll be, we'll, we'll be trying to, we, there's a reference that I'm gonna leave here if you wanna know more about this, but we'll be trying to publish about this shortly in the coming month. So I mentioned that concern related to, to TC about short-term exposure. Uh, this comes from a 2011 uh, 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 updated iRISC assessment by EPA where they lowered the reference concentration uh, for TC to a value of two microgram per cubic meter based on fetal cardiac malformation uh, observed during the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, so that creates a very large uh, uh, sensitive population. Essentially, any building could have the sensitive population. Uh, and, and it remains controversial to date. Not all states, well, there's one state that dissents about this is, is Indiana. But since that time, many states and US EPA region have created, uh, uh, well, they, they are different terms, but accelerated response action level, imminent hazard, uh, short-term target, typical terms, on the order of a few microgram per cubic meter. So California use two and six for urgent. I believe Massachusetts is something similar. Uh, the value of six microgram per cubic meter constitute a imminent hazard value uh, and so on. Uh, since that time, there's about 15 states that have uh, created some type of accelerated response if some uh, uh, measurements in exceedance of a few microgram cubic per cubic meter are observed. That requires uh, prompt follow-up, uh, notification of the agencies, uh, rapid response, typically the deployment of air purifying units, and a short-term uh, time frame for implementation of, of long-term mitigation. Because it's, uh, it's such a prompt, a short-term response, that remains very difficult to tackle, uh, considering that uh, we tend to like to sample in the winter, we tend to use sumacans, not all sumacans are available at the same time. So it is logistically difficult and it's become a challenge. It's remained a challenge over the past uh, five plus years. So my, my last slide is uh, whether uh, winter is worse still true. Most state guidance suggests to sample in the winter. Uh, why? Because in the winter, you tend to have the stack effects that I mentioned earlier, more soil gas entry, uh, uh, less building air exchange since the windows are closed. Uh, but ideally, uh, uh, sampling on a very cold day or on a day where temperature have dropped, maybe even more important than sampling on any winter day. Um, there are, however, factors that can be conducive to summer is worse. Uh, during the summer, there's less moisture in the ground. Uh, the water table is lower. There are uh, more uh, volatilization, more potential for diffusion, and windows can all be also be closed. So um, in, in, if you look at recent guidance, states have become fairly aware that uh, while winter is, is important, there could be other seasons during which to sample. And for that reason, nowadays you tend to see guidance where there's expectation you will sample during the winter, but also uh, during another season. So I try to compile all of these consideration in a poster that I presented at the UMass conference last year. So it's almost a year old, it's probably already a little dated. Uh, but I'm, le I'm leaving the link here if you want to know more information about what different states do uh, for, for sampling requirement. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to take any question. This is my email information, uh, laurent.levy at jacobs.com if you have questions. And this is the link to my blog. Sorry for running a little bit over time, but I'm happy to answer any question you have. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you came up to right at the point where I was going to have to cut in, but <laughs> so perfect. Thank you so much, Laurent.
Um, that was a great overview. It's always super interesting to see what other states are doing. Um, we just really have one uh, basic question um, at this point, because you did such a good job just explaining things that people didn't have questions about it. Um, so, uh, but they're wondering, at the beginning you talked about PCE, TC, and benzene, but are there any other chemicals uh, that you would have at a site where um, you really need to be thinking about vapor intrusion? Like, are there, is there a list somewhere about key chemicals that if you're finding them at a site, you really need to look into um, vapor intrusion? They they tend very often. I would say some states will develop develop. So uh, Wisconsin is a is a very good example. Uh, and and I'm not saying to, this to advertise for Wisconsin is because I often look at it. Well, I kind of like their guidance. Um, they do provide short short list of the usual suspects. Um, in general, I would say you know all chemicals are prone to vapor intrusion. The reason TC, PC, and and benzene. Uh, often come up is because they have low screening levels. Um, so a chemical with low screening level, a long history of usage, and uh, low ability to degrade tend to uh, tend to come back often. And very often you're going to see wh where you have TCE in groundwater, you often have 111 TCA, but because the screening level are higher uh, and because TCA tends to break down a little bit more, uh, you tend not to talk about it, even though you will you will detect it, um, but so it, it's often the driver chemical that gets that gets the the uh, the spotlight. Uh, but short short list of guidance like Wisconsin uh, or uh, it's is is a good place to start to find the usual suspects. Great, and I'm happy to provide that 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 uh, that that document. Okay, the link to this or are you? People can find it on your blog, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I think in the interest of time, we will um, switch switch our presenters. But um, we do have another question that came in. But I have a feeling that David is going to talk about this, but maybe not. Um, so I'll ask it, and if he could just say he is or he isn't, and if he's not, you can you can answer it now. Um, when would you use an eight-hour SUMA canister as opposed to twenty-four hours? Yeah, so this is Dave. Um, typically, an eight-hour SUMA can is used in a, uh, a setting where uh, it's a, a workplace setting where eight hours is a typical period of time that uh, somebody will be uh, working in that environment. A 24-hour sample is more typically used in a residential setting where there's a potential for uh, people to be in a home you know, round the clock, at least on the weekends. Uh, so that's that's just the general rule of thumb, 24 hours uh, for residential and eight hours for, for uh, commercial and industrial workplace settings. Okay, great. So I think, uh, David, I gave you control uh, for the slides, so you need to accept that, and then I'll introduce him. So our next presenter is going to go a lot more into actual the nuts and bolts of assessing uh, for vapor intrusion. Uh, he is a principal engineer, David Che, sorry, <laughs> he's a principal engineer with Sanborn Head and Associates, located in their Concord, New Hampshire office, where he is responsible for leading vapor intrusion and environmental remediation projects throughout the U.S. and abroad. David specializes in vapor intrusion assessment and mitigation for residential, commercial, and industrial buildings, including some of the largest vapor intrusion sites in the world. He leads product strategy development and provides technical expertise to private and public sector clients. David holds his BS uh, from Princeton University and has his master's in um, uh, civil and environmental engineering from MIT. So we're all MIT folks today um, on this webinar, Laurent, David, and also myself. Um, he has David has 30 years of experience, and he's also a licensed professional engineer in 16 states. So with that, take it away, David. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and can you see my screen OK? Yes, I can. And you can hear me OK?
Great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. <clears throat> These are the topics we'll cover, uh, starting with the basic nuts and bolts of conventional sampling methods and QAQC, per vapor intrusion assessment, including soil gas, subslab gas, and indoor air sampling. And then we'll follow that up with some more recent advancements in VI assessment intended to address some of the challenges that uh, Laurent touched on earlier and some of the shortcomings of conventional VI assessment methods. And some of these tools uh, we'll look at are real-time field screening, building pressure testing, a longer-term sampling, and uh, a recent initiative from US EPA uh, around guided sampling. So before we dive into the details, I just wanted to share an example of why we're talking about VI. This is one of the poster child sites for classic VI, where a groundwater plume is driving vapor intrusion risk beneath an entire village in the town of Endicott, New York. Uh, the original uh, semiconductor manufacturing facility is located up here north of the plume can see the plume uh, moving towards the Susquehanna River. And we're looking at um, more than a thousand properties over a 350 acre area impacted by vapor intrusion. Uh, this site uh, contributed a significant portion of the data used by US EPA to develop the generic attenuation factors for VI. Um, and the conventional VI assessment methods we used at this site, um, which included a prominent role for exterior soil gas sampling, we'll touch on some of that today. In the end, uh, this site uh, resulted in mitigation of over 450 homes and businesses. And uh, I don't have it here, but actually that plume is largely gone now. And um, the, uh, the question on the table which we're starting to look at right now is whether we need to continue to operate the, um, the subslab depressurization systems in all these homes. So stay tuned for more and for that information on that in the future. So we're going to talk about sampling methods in the order that they would be typically conducted at a new site, moving from exterior investigations to interior investigations and that's only if the exterior data indicate that there is a need to go inside to assess potential indoor air exposures. So starting with exterior soil gas sampling, this is a photo of exterior soil gas sampling at the Endicott site. The major benefit of exterior soil gas sampling is that it can help narrow the focus of properties that need to undergo interior sampling which obviously can be uh, very disruptive. So the idea here is if you can, if you have a, a groundwater plume underneath a neighborhood, if you can do an initial job of delineating where the soil gas impacts are, uh, that is a, a important first step before having to go and uh, knock on people's homes and start uh, doing indoor air sampling and subslab sampling potentially. Another benefit is that it can be um, that this exterior soil gas sampling can be done concurrent with beta zone geology profiling to identify factors that can either promote or hinder vapor intrusion. Um, factors such as soil type, soil layering, and moisture content, all of these um, beta zone characteristics have a role in the potential for soil vapor migration up from the groundwater table and towards a uh, towards the structure. On the flip side, um, soil gas, exterior soil gas sampling, um, many states favor subslab sampling over exterior soil gas sampling uh, for, for use for comparing to screening levels and indoor air samples. Uh, there's also the potential for uh, spatial and temporal variability uh, with exterior soil, soil gas sampling, uh, particularly for the shallower soil gas samples. Uh, the deeper you go with exterior soil gas sampling, uh, in general, 
uh, the lower the, the, uh, the variability in the concentration results. And then uh, the final con point here is that um, exterior soil gas sampling on its own, if it's the only line of evidence that you rely on, could potentially miss uh, exterior preferential pathways, uh, such as utility trenches and um, sewer lines, which has gained recent prominence as a potential pathway into, into structures. So these are some photos of the installation of single-use exterior soil gas sampling points using both manual and hydraulic push tools. Uh, what, you're so, what you're seeing here is a, a typical um, setup. Uh, it consists of an expendable dry point. It's driven by a hammer or a hydraulic push. And then the rod is retracted, exposing a screen. And then that screen is connected to a tube uh, that comes up through the rod and then that tube can be connected to a uh, peristaltic pump for example or directly to a, a SUMA canister uh, and then uh, you can draw a soil gas sample that way. These are, uh, these are uh, typical approaches used for sort of one-time exterior soil gas uh, sampling survey purposes. At the same time, uh, permanent soil gas probes can be valuable when there's a known VOC presence in the Vado zone and, and there's a need to assess how soil gas conditions and concentrations might be changing over a longer period of time. For example, uh, when monitoring the progress of remediation, uh, such as in a soil vapor extraction system or remediation system. And this slide shows a schematic of a nested multi-depth cluster of exterior soil gas sampling ports. And they're intended to assess the potential attenuation of soil gas concentrations moving from just above the water table upward through the Vado zone towards uh, the basement level. And this slide is, uh, uh, shows how an exterior soil gas investigation um, was used to rule out vapor intrusion down gradient of a release site. The facility footprint is shown here in the up, upper right hand corner and groundwater was present at only about uh, 10 to 12 feet below ground. But as a result of groundwater characterization at multi-depths, uh, a vertical hydraulic gradient was um, observed and that gradient was causing the dissolved phase plume to migrate vertically basically doing a bit of a dive uh, downward with distance from the release site. Um, furthermore the exterior soil gas uh, exterior, exterior soil investigation which also consisted of uh, Vado zone logging and profiling indicated that the, uh, the soils were silt and clay rich and had a high moisture content uh, that acted as a barrier to upward vapor migration. So the, the conceptual site model here suggested that the combination of a diving plume uh, coupled with a, uh, a, vado, a vado zone that was um, low permeability and high moisture content was going to be a combination that would um, preclude the possibility of a vapor intrusion into the structures overlying this, this plume. And so the final piece of, of evidence that was used to rule out VI at this site was to collect um, soil gas samples in the Vado zone in the neighborhood. And all of those soil gas samples came back as not detected. So it was a nice, a nice coupling of um, Vado zone profiling with, um, with, with groundwater characterization uh, to come up with a complete picture of, uh, of the potential exposure to vapor intrusion that ultimately concluded that it was not a risk at this site. Sampling of subslab vapor typically requires drilling a hole through the floor. And for a single sampling event, a temporary seal can be used. In this case, it's a beeswax seal, uh, which then can be patched easily afterwards. 
But when uh, multiple sampling events are needed, similar to exterior soil gas sampling, permanent subslab sampling ports can be installed. And these are commonly used when a, a subslab depressurization system is installed and as a means of monitoring subslab vacuum uh, when that is needed. And there are some design, there are, these are some design details for a permanent subslab monitoring port. And this slide shows some photos of an installation of a permanent subslab monitoring port. And these can be installed to be very unobtrusive uh, in tile or carpeted areas. And a common commercial product is shown here on the right. And moving to the sampling of these ports, uh, here are some photos of sampling subslab ports. The photo in the middle shows the collection of a primary and uh, field duplicate sample from a subslab port. And the photo on the right shows uh, the integrity testing of port construction using a helium test. And the purpose of this test is to ensure you have a good seal at the surface and there's no, um, there's no uh, leakage of, of indoor air or atmospheric air into the, into the sampling port uh, construction. So this is, a, this is typically many, many of the state guidance documents recommend an integrity or a leak test of, of exterior or, or interior subslab ports. And this is a setup of how that would be done. I'll refer to some of the guidance documents for more details on how this is conducted. So um, how many subslab locations should be sampled? Uh, various state guidance documents rec recommend something like two to four samples for residential settings. And for larger residential or commercial industrial buildings, uh, this is a table from NJDEP's VI guidance, which includes uh, a table that's based on square footage of the building. But the guidance, the guidance acknowledges that the number of subslab sub samples cannot be based on area alone. Um, professional judgment uh, needs to come in into the picture. And um, this makes sense because there are many other important factors to consider in selecting the number and location of subslab sampling ports, such as the history of the building, how much, where chemicals were used, where there were spills, or uh, uh, even the building construction itself, the presence of foundation, complex foundation elements, uh, or a building that might actually be a building that was um, constructed over many decades and, and may include several different foundation elements, basically a building that's been cobbled together from many, many uh, smaller buildings. Uh, you would ideally want to treat each one of those areas as a separate building and, and have a subslab sample from, uh, from each one of those areas. So that's, that's why it's, it's fine to start with some guidance on the number of samples, but you have to look at each building individually to understand the, the building specific factors that will influence uh, an appropriate number of samples. For subslab and soil gas sampling, this table is uh, an attempt to summarize some common sources of error and bias, along with QA, QC measures that can be taken and some lessons learned. And starting with the top here, um, and, and many of the guidance documents touch on these, on these potential sources of error and bias. There's the, the possibility of sample dilution due to leaky surface seals, drawing in ambient air, which can then dilute your sample. Uh, we, we saw a photo a couple slides ago about how to, how to address that issue by conducting an integrity testing. You can also want to maintain your sample flow rate uh, at a, a level generally below 200 milliliters per minute. Uh, the, the rationale there is by pulling any, any faster on your sampling port, you're potentially going to be uh, creating a higher vacuum that might draw in ambient air. Uh, some lessons learned on that topic are to use ultra high purity helium as a tracer uh, and avoid uh, some of the older guidances and, and procedures for leak testing uh, used sulfur hexafluoride, but, but that's a greenhouse gas that we'd prefer not to use. The second line here on the table is um, dilution of your sample due to leaky tube fittings and connections. 
Uh, the New Jersey VI guidance has uh, some, some good QAQC procedures for conducting a shut-in test to ensure uh, good tight seals. And lessons learned here are to use gas tight fittings and avoid, avoid quick connect fittings if at all possible, which are more prone to leakage. Uh, third line down is, has to do with the types of uh, tubing that, are be, that is being used to collect the, the sample. You want to use uh, tubing that's inert to the VOCs being analyzed. Um, so Teflon lined or stainless steel tubing are standards of practice. And um, it's a good practice also to discard tubing after each sample. And avoid Tigon and low density polyethylene, polyethylene or vinyl tubing as these, these types of materials have the potential to either adsorb or desorb VOCs if, um, if used uh, repeatedly. Uh, back in the day, uh, Tedlar bags were commonly used for collecting um, soil gas and, um, and, and even indoor air samples. But we've, we know now that uh, Tedlar bags may themselves contain VOCs as a result of their manufacturing. Um, and, and not only that, over time, the, the bag itself allows VOC diffusion in and out over a period of days. So um, Tedlar bags still have a place. Uh, they're probably best used in, in a screening situation where you're going to get your sample and analyze it quickly. For example, having a field instrument um, is a good use for Tedlar bags, uh, analyzing those samples within three hours to avoid VOC loss. And then uh, the last line there, well, SUMA canisters are, are still the, the usual method of collecting subslab and soil gas samples for lab analysis and we'll cover that when we get to indoor air sampling which is what we're going to move on to next here um, we'll we'll look at some conventional indoor air sampling along with typical state guidelines and these guidelines include starting with a pre-sampling survey and we'll have more on that on the next slide uh, but other typical state guidelines for indoor air sampling are to use the SUMA canisters uh, for TO15 analysis. This is, this is kind of the gold standard for indoor air sampling and QAQC purposes. Um, state, states typically uh, commonly um, recommend analyzing for the full TO15 analyte list unless there's justification for narrowing the list. And the full TO15 list is something upwards of, of more than 60, maybe 70 compounds. So um, if, there is, if there is a justification for narrowing the list, uh, it's a good, good idea to try to take advantage of that uh, so you can, you can focus your efforts on the compounds that are of most concern. Uh, here's that fourth bullet here is the question about 24 hour versus eight hour. Um, the, the rule of thumb is that 24 hour SUMA samples are typically used in residential settings and eight hours are used for, for workplace settings. Uh, but th that's, that's not the only way it needs to be done. We're gonna touch on longer term samples that, that can be appropriate for both uh, indoor, for both residential and commercial uh, spaces as well. Second to last bullet here, again, we're still on typical state guidelines, um, is to collect at least one sample from the likely space where vapor intrusion may be occurring, such as a basement or a crawl space, and one sample from the lowest living, uh, lowest occupied level of the structure. And when, when you are collecting concurrent subslab samples, uh, you wanna do that so that you avoid indoor air uh, contamination from from the subslab sample so typically you collect your uh, you collect your indoor air sample first before you drill through the slab and, and collect your subslab sample so for sampling with SUMA canisters including not just indoor air but also soil gas and subslab vapor um, this table summarizes some common sources of error and bias along with QAQC measure, measures and and lessons learned and I won't go through all of these here. I'll just um, maybe note that uh, the, the collection of um, uh, flow controllers can often be a, an issue with, uh, with, their, with their calibration. Uh, so 
in, in many of our investigations, we order we order multiple flow controllers. These are these are devices that allow a sample to be collected over a, a specified period of time, such as eight hours or 24 hours. Um, when you're collecting sample with a flow controller, you're going to need to check the canister vacuum several times during sampling to make sure that uh, the vacuum is um, is dropping at a rate that is in agreement with the, the period of time you want to collect your sample. So you're not ending up with uh, an eight hour sample when you intended a 24 hour sample. So just some, some real world experience with, with some of the challenges of, of collecting SUMA canister samples over, over eight or 24 hour periods. So I'm going to uh, zoom in on two key factors now that make indoor air sampling challenging for BI assessment and how these, ch how these challenges might be addressed. And the first is the issue of background and indoor air sources of VOCs. And the second is the issue of time variability of VI, uh, which Laurent uh, touched on earlier. Here's some more examples of photos taken from residences and businesses where VI assessments have been conducted, where the target analytes, in this case, PC and TCE, were, were found in the products being used in the homes and businesses. Uh, there was one, one uh, commercial building that we were assessing that included a full drum of pure trichloroethylene. And this building was in a very highly, high, highly sensitive VI neighborhood. And uh, initially the detections of, of you know, very high levels of TCE in this building were cause for alarm uh, for a major VI problem. And it turned out, <laughs> The building itself had a had a 55 gallon drum of TCE inside of it, so it's a, it's a real issue uh, dealing with um, with background sources of, of VOCs that you're trying to assess for VI. So um, some of the common sources of the uh, indoor sources of the VOCs: the household and commercial products, dry clean clothes, building materials, former chemical use. Uh, absorbed into the building walls and floors. This can be more of a factor in older buildings, older industrial buildings that have a history of spillage and, and uh, operations that had poor chemical handling processes where spills have now have been absorbed into the, into the building slab or into the walls of the building. And we'll, uh, we've seen sites where this has been an issue, well, continued off-gassing of VOCs from spillage and then there's always, uh, particularly with benzene in, in urban settings, VOCs entering from outdoor air and distinguishing, dis distinguishing benzene in, in urban environments uh, in indoor air from benzene that is, is common in the outdoor air in urban environments. So some of the, the common QAQC measures you'll see in the state VI guidance documents are, are listed here. Uh, these are, are good, uh, good standards of practice to follow, but they're, they're not necessarily guarantees that you're going to eliminate the possibility of uh, detecting an indoor air source. Uh, the last bullet here um, is, is the original conventional means of trying to figure out if a indoor air detection is related to vapor intrusion or indoor air source is to collect a concurrent subslab sample for comparison. And that's generally a good rule of thumb but there are, there are sites where subslab vapor has been contaminated because of high concentrations in the indoor air, uh, where there's basically reverse vapor intrusion. Vapors are moving outward from the building into the subslab gas. So that, that's unusual, but it is a, it is a possibility. So uh, vapor intrusion, moving on from background indoor air sources, just um, we'll, we'll get to some techniques to try to distinguish that issue, but just touching on the time variability of vapor intrusion, these two graphs highlight that, that variable nature of VI. <clears throat> on the left are TCE concentrations in indoor air at the Arizona State University Research House, known as Sun Devil Manor out in Utah. And on the right, are uh, PCE concentrations in indoor air in a print shop uh, that are varying on a daily cycle over about a two-week period. 
And back here on the left, this is, a, this is more than a two-year period of indoor air monitoring at the uh, Sun Devil Manor site. And you can see the, um, you can see the variability in, in both a residential and a commercial setting where if you were to go into either one of these in, into either one of these structures and collect a, you know, a single 24-hour sample, uh, chances are high that you're, you're, you're unlikely to capture either the worst case short-term or the long-term average concentration. So uh, just highlighting what that, that challenge is of uh, using 24, eight, eight hour or 24 hour samples to uh, make a conclusion about exposure uh, from VI. So how many, how many indoor air sample events are typically uh, recommended? Uh, these are a few of few states uh, in the in the Numoa group. Um, the guidance guidance here is, you know, is, is variable. Um, Maine is Maine recommends four successive clean rounds spaced three months apart to conclude no VI pathway. Uh, you know, all the way down to New York, which recommends multiple rounds across several heating seasons. Uh, but but right in there in the middle, New Hampshire, uh, one round in late winter or early spring, that, that may be enough under New Hampshire's guidelines to conclude that uh, you know, no further assessment is required. So a lot of, a lot of uh, variability in state guidance on how many indoor air sampling events. So let's, let's now turn to um, methods and tools we'll use to address indoor air sources and variability. And these will include uh, real-time screening and continuous monitoring, building pressure tests, longer term samples, and then uh, a more recent initiative called guided sampling, uh, guided sampling uh, using uh, some indicator of potential VI such as temperature, radon, or, or other parameters. And we'll take these uh, one by one. Uh, looking at real-time VI assessment with, uh, starting with real-time assessment with a portable analyzer. And I'll just give you a, a, case, a case example to illustrate how this was done. This was a 100,000 square foot building where TCE was used in the 60s and 70s. There was a known subsurface TCE presence identified below the building in groundwater at a depth of about five feet below the slab. So there was a uh, there was a concern that vapor intrusion was going to be an issue in this building. Uh, so the, the real-time assessment involved going in there with a portable analyzer and, and moving throughout the building, uh, looking for indoor air concentrations uh, for TCE. And this, uh, this ability to get real-time samples allows for a rapid assessment and ability to change your approach dynamically uh, as you're as you're moving as you're getting the results back and you and you want to look at an area in more detail. So in this example, there were over 62 samples collected over two days, and the TCE concentrations in the building are posted here, ranging from 15 to 690 micrograms per cubic meter with a median of 71. Now, if we undertook this assessment using a conventional sampling approach. We would have placed SUMA canisters out here in the building, um, collected them probably over eight hours, had to, had to wait for two to three weeks to get the lab results back, and then um, you know, get a, a real scattering of results that would have required us to go back in and do more sampling, and it resulted in an iterative process that could probably would have taken months. But, the, but having the portable analyzer there allowed for a rapid assessment of where the concentrations were highest, and then that allowed for focusing in on where the, the vapor intrusion pathways might be. And uh, some examples shown here as a result of using, uh, having the ability to do real-time portable analysis. Um, there's, there were floor trenches along the building perimeter uh, where TCE was coming out at 2,700 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, adding insult to injury, this trench was in a mechanical room with an air handler where the TCE was being drawn into the air handler and then distributed throughout the building. So an unfortunate case of turbocharged VI in this, in this instance. Uh, this building also had a, um, a storm drain network underneath it. Uh, the contaminated groundwater was infiltrating into the storm sewer. 
Uh, so a sewer VI situation where we're contaminated um, sewer gas, uh, and this was storm sewer gas, was coming out through the manholes and hatches uh, leading to the storm sewer at elevated concentrations. So um, having that at portable analyzer was, was essential to a rapid assessment of what the conditions were in the building and why they were, why we were seeing what we were seeing. And eventually led to the mitigation approach. And this is just a chart of a pre and post mitigation uh, screening results. The, the, screen, the pre mitigation screening results are shown here. These are the same results I mentioned earlier before any mitigation was done. And then after mitigation, which involved a combination of things like subslab depressurization and sealing manholes, uh, there was the ability to do a rapid assessment of the, su of the success of the post mitigation. And then once there was confidence that the mitigation was successful, uh, we could move on to the SUMACAN sampling and got very good agreement be between the, the, uh, the eight hour SUMA canister samples and the, and the portable uh, screening samples. So another example of the power of having real time information, uh, this, was a, this was a former mill building where PCE and TCE were detected in conventional samples and in indoor air. Uh, the former mill building had been converted to apartments um, set up as artistic residences. And if you, if, you've, uh, if you have any familiarity with these kinds of, of uh, residential settings, the artists use all kinds of, of interesting chemicals and, and products in their work. And so there is a question of whether uh, what was being seen in indoor air was a result of VI from historical mill operations or because the artists were bringing in funky chemicals to use as part of their artwork. So uh, having the portable real-time analyzer there, in this case a HAP site, uh, was a very important um, way to distinguish VI from indoor air sources. And as it turns out, um, the PCE that was being detected in our air was due to the art supplies being used by the artists. But um, the TCE uh, was actually coming in through the floor slab, through cracks, and that was directly measured with the instrument. So the, the remediation here involved um, upgrading the subslab depressurization system to focus on areas where this was occurring and, um, and, and, and informing the artists that uh, you know, some of the chemicals they were using uh, were causing some of the air exceedances that were observed. So that's uh, one type of instrument. That um, another type is a continuous real-time air monitoring instrument, <clears throat> and this was used at a site in uh, San Diego, where um, we saw this chart earlier. Uh, a two-week period, basically a two-week period, where PCE is increasing every night, and it turns out that was happening when the HVAC system was off. So having this ability to see uh, in high resolution what the indoor air concentrations look like uh, was, was, in, was critical to understanding where the PCE was coming, uh, why the PCE concentrations were what they were and where it was coming from. Another example of continuous air monitoring, this was air monitoring being conducted at a, another commercial building where um, there was subslab presence of TCE and um, a subslab depressurization system was put in. And these are four, four continuously monitored indoor air locations in this building. Uh, the, the instrument was set up in one of the offices. And uh, before startup of the subslab mitigation system, a, a record of what the TCE concentrations looked like before mitigation was obtained. And then when the mitigation system was started up, uh, there was immediate evidence of, this, of the performance of the mitigation system knocking those concentrations to non-detect. And having the ability to see, to see the, the, um, the, the effects of the subslab de uh, depressurization system on indoor air uh, was very helpful in um, you know, fine-tuning the, the subslab depressurization system, system and confirming that it is operating appropriately. So advantages of real-time and continuous uh, data monitoring. There's no waiting two weeks or more for the lab results. You're getting lots of data, and that offers opportunity to identify variability and patterns. 
It can help you distinguish VI from indoor chemicals, which is one of the main, main challenges with VI assessments. It allows you to, to do some detective work and sleuthing to find VI entry pathways. It can inform your best mitigation strategy, and it can allow you to immediately evaluate your mitigation effectiveness. And just one more example of real-time monitoring. This, this is an example where the HVAC system was being used as the VI mitigation approach. I'll start with the bottom graph. This is a plot of uh, pressure relative to subslab. So all these green values are, are less than zero. It means the building pressure is positive relative to the subslab. And this is a, over a period of about a month. So during this period where the building is under positive pressure, uh, the TCE concentrations are also being continuously monitored. They're basically flatlined at non-detect, except for a couple of blips, um, until we get to a point where the HVAC system undergoes a, a change. Uh, in this case, the outside air damper was uh, closed down, uh, resulting in less air dilution and mixing in the building. and and the pro and the pressure in the building actually goes uh, negative relative to the subslab. And you can see that immediate change in the, in the subslab pressure correlates with a, a very rapid change in the indoor air concentrations. So uh, proving that the HVAC system is uh, essential and the positive pressure being created by the HVAC system is an important component to, um, to preventing BI in this building. And once the, once the dampers were opened back to where they should be, uh, the indoor air concentrations dropped back down. So uh, the EPA has, uh, uh, for those folks that are, are affiliated with the states, um, EPA has the, the, the TAGA mobile laboratories available. There's three of these units, I, I believe, that are available. Um, uh, and there's an entire presentation on continuous VI sampling using uh, EPA's mobile uh, trace atmospheric gas analyzer. Uh, it's available at Clue-In, and uh, Dave McCunis, uh is, uh is the contact for that information. So I'm um, going to move to uh, building pressure testing. And the, the concept here is to use the building pressure as a means to either force VI or suppress VI. And the idea is that if uh, a building is, is forced to be under pressurized, you're, you're creating conditions that would induce vapor intrusion so that uh, concentrations may increase if you have vapor intrusion potential when the building is under pressurized. And if you over pressurize the building, uh, you have the potential to suppress vapor intrusion. So I'll, I'll walk through a a quick example of how this was done in a, an industrial building. It was a, a manufacturing building that uh, used uh, PCE and TCE in the past. There was a known subslab uh, presence of VOCs, and the question was whether um, the indoor air uh, concentrations were being affected by vapor intrusion or by off-gassing from the slab and the walls. So the first step was to just do a baseline survey of initial conditions of indoor air concentrations. And these boxes show the uh, PCE and TCE concentrations in indoor air using the, the portable instrument. And these concentrations lined up well with previous uh, conventional sampling results. So we're starting in the, in the right place uh, with baseline conditions. Uh, and these are under, under normal HVA, HVAC operations with neutral pressure. The next step was to induce a negative pressure in the building. Uh, you can see that from the orange lines indicating uh, the, the, the space is being under pressurized. And as a result, the, the PCE, TCE concentrations increase immediately, as shown in these boxes here. And this is just a chart of the, of the pressure during normal operations. It's about neutral at zero, and then modifying the conditions to make the building go negative and some of the uh, concentrations in indoor air of PCE measured during this, those two conditions, there's a clear, clear uptick in indoor air PCE concentrations when the building is, is made negative. So this was clear indication of, of a potential for vapor intrusion, and that led to uh, detective work to try to figure out where it was coming from, 
and it turned out that the expansion joints and cracks in the floor slab were um, some of the pathways for vapor entry as indicated by these high concentrations. So um, back to the benefits of real-time assessment. Um, all this work was done in, in one day um, and immediately identified what was happening there without having to do sub-slab sampling. And, while, and at the same time, identifying how the VOCs were getting into the building, which suggested a remedial solution involving recaulking and sealing the joints. And just a quick hypothetical cost comparison of using a conventional approach versus a, a more uh, uh, advanced approach is about a, a, a factor of three difference in the total cost. Um, th this is a simplified cost estimate, so don't take it to the bank, but it gives you an order of magnitude of the potential savings involved in, in being able to get uh, a lot of data uh, in, in a short period of time versus having to do multiple sampling campaigns and waiting for lab results to come back over a period of weeks. So uh, I'll just touch on long-term sampling as another, another uh, tool that could be used uh, to, to um, address long-term variability in indoor air quality that might be missed by sampling over uh, 24 hours. Um, the, there are pros and cons to uh, longer-term samples. Uh, these are called passive samplers, a couple of different types here. Uh, some of the advantages are that they are small and easy to use, easy to ship. They typically cost less than summa, summa canister samples, and they can provide one day to 30 day or more uh, composite samples that can capture longer-term variability. On the downside, you have to be careful with selecting the sampling device. You need to work with the laboratory to make sure you're, you're picking the right sorbent material and the de deployment time you want to achieve target analyte reporting limits. Um, some VOCs are not, uh, are not amenable to using passive samplers. Um, there's a possibility if you're looking at sh for short-term spikes and peaks, uh, this might not be the approach to use. And uh, ultimately, when you're getting to a risk, risk management decision, um, you, you might need to make a case for using these types of samples in place of the 24-hour SUMA samples. I'm going to skip that slide and just let you know that if you're looking for more information on passive samplers, um, there's, there's at least two, two foundational documents here, an EPA engineering issue paper on passive samplers and an ESTCP cost and performance report on passive samplers that include a wealth of information on uh, how these could be used on, on your VI projects. So I'll finish up. Um, I'll briefly touch on a recent US EPA initiative called Guided Sampling. It's being led by Henry Schuver, who I think might be on the call today. And the premise here is to use indicator parameters of when VI is more or most likely, and then sample when those indicators are favorable for VI, and conversely, sam avoid sampling for VI when the indicators are not favorable. So just uh, two more slides to go. Uh, as an example, this is a cross plot of TCE concentration versus temperature differential between indoor and outdoor temperature. This is Sun Devil Manor again. And the yellow bar indicates where the temperature exceeds the 90th percentile. And the red bar indicates where the TCE concentration exceeds the 95th percentile. So the shaded portion of the graph here in the upper right quadrant indicates where TC samples were elevated when the differential temperature was also elevated. So using differential temperature as an indicator of likely VI exposure at this house provides a 34% chance of capturing the highest TCE concentrations. Now that may not sound great, but if you look at the converse situation, when differential temperature is not elevated, there's a 98% chance that sampling during this period would not reveal the elevated TCE concentrations that occur in other times, even though uh, they can happen in this house. So sampling when differential temperature is not elevated is highly unlikely to reveal elevated TCE concentrations in indoor air. Uh, this is the same type of plot for radon. In this case, radon actually has a, does a better job than differential temperature. It has a 40% a chance of indicating elevated TCE and a true negative rate of 99%. So this means it's unlikely that sampling when radon levels are low uh, will reveal uh, 
the, the possibility of elevated TC concentrations at this house. So based on the initial results of guided sampling efforts and more projects are, are certainly being studied, it has been found that there is a highly confident negative predictive value of temperature differential and radon. So sampling for VI when these parameters are not elevated will not likely with greater than 95% confidence reveal short term or worst case VI. Conversely, sampling when these parameters are elevated is more likely to find elevated VOC levels from VI with a 30 to 40% positive predictive value. Um, this approach requires real-time monitoring of temperature differential and radon, and there's other parameters, including pressure that could be brought into the mix here uh, to select conditions favorable for sampling to capture short-term worst-case VI. And I mentioned Henry Schuver, and that's his contact information. He's been leading, leading the charge on this for EPA, and they're doing some really good work. So my last slide here is just up the wrap-up messages. Um, conventional VI sampling methods are well-established, but they're hindered by their snapshot nature and prone to error and bias, like missing variability and indoor air and background VOC sources. But there's tools and methods available to reduce this uncertainty inherent in conventional VI assessment methods, including the ones we just talked about. And stay tuned to the active research area going on right now, the temporal variability in VI. Uh, the question is, can we use guided sampling to, uh, to select times when uh, we might be able to capture a reasonable max maximum exp exposure? So stay tuned. Uh, EPA has been having, uh, having seminars and webinars on this topic and looking forward to, to those results. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and appreciate it. Great, thank you, David. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions and we're starting to run out of time. Sorry, folks. I don't know if a few people can stay on a little bit later and we can try to work through these. Um, but um, let's see, um, let's start more at the beginning. So every site is different, but is there a general relationship of VOC concentration and plume depth, depth <laughs> sorry, plume depth that would uh, trigger an investigation? You know, like is there is there any sort of rules of thumb about when you need an investigation and when maybe you don't need to worry about it too much? So that, that gets to, um, so the general rules of thumb, that, that gets to screening distances and, and that gets to what uh, different states have for screening distances, the, the distances between a structure and the groundwater or a known beta zone source. Um, but it's tricky that it's the beta zone geology that can have um, a major impact on uh, on the effects of a groundwater uh, a gra contaminant groundwater plume affecting VI. In Endicott, um, the groundwater depth was was uh, variable, but as deep as 50 feet in some places, and that wasn't deep enough to prevent a VI risk. In other sites, groundwater can be you know, 10 to 12 feet down, and yet we saw in that earlier example that, um, that vapor intrusion wasn't a concern because the Beto zone geology was, was favorable to suppressing the eye through uh, low permeability, high moisture content soils. So it is true that every site is different, and when, you, when you're just starting without any, any information at all, the, the place to turn is to the screening distances. And um, I, offhand, I want to say, um, uh, you know, some, some states look at 100 feet lateral distance between the plume and a structure and 30 feet vertically. But those are just, just general numbers and you really should look at uh, the individual state and the individual site. Okay. Um, are there disadvantages to using isopropyl, isopropyl, I guess, isopropyl alcohol as a tracer? Uh, there could be. Um, those can cause uh, what's called non-target interferences in the lab in the lab analysis. Um, if your sample is laden with uh, with with alcohols, um, it, even though it's not a concern from a, a vapor intrusion standpoint, it might impact the ability of the lab to get you. The, the low detection limits you need for the compounds you're interested in. Okay. 
Um, the portable analyzers, are they really a screening tool or can you can they be used um, in the regulatory decision making setting? Or or how do you use how do you uh, support them? Well, we, we use them we use them as far as we can go up to the point where uh, so we 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 I recommend using them as much as possible. Uh, they're accurate enough to do most of the assessment work you need to do. And when you get to a point where you feel you've got you've got the site and the structure understood, uh, then you may need to transition to a final round of conventional samples. And we found whenever we've done that. Um, they line up very well with all of the screening work that's been done ahead of time. So uh, unless there's unusual circumstances, um, uh, it, it's, it can be very beneficial to move forward with, with screening tools and, and reserve the, the conventional um, lab results to, to um, once you feel like you've got an understanding of what's going on, you want to confirm that with, with, the, with the fixed laboratory results. And we okay. found regula regulators are very, very open to the rapid assessment and the real-time information. Uh, we have worked in many states and haven't had any objections to um, undertaking the bulk of an assessment using screening tools, uh, recognizing ultimately we will transition to, uh, to conventional methods. Okay. Uh, for sub-slab, samples, what's the recommended sample duration? Like what time period are you fucking on them? <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, some it's it's anywhere from 15 minutes to 24 hours. Um, some some states recommend collecting concurrent indoor air and sub slab samples in a in a residential setting, both types of samples over a 24 hour period. Um, that that may be the uh, the right approach for a garden variety um, groundwater plume uh, VI situation. If you're looking at um, a, a building that you know you've got uh, a potential for a release directly under the building, you don't need to collect 24-hour subslab samples. A 15-minute or a one-hour subslab sample can be fine, or even just a screening sample uh, would would be adequate. You're, you're really just looking for, um, in a case where there might be a source under the building, you're looking to confirm the source and, and how extensive it might be. Uh, and so you can, use, you can use shorter term samples for that type of analysis. Uh, in, a, in a more sensitive environment, like a residential setting, uh, where there, there may be more variability in the subslab concentrations, um, taking a longer term uh, sample might be more appropriate. Okay. Uh, what's the best way to collect a, a field duplicate for a sub for a sub slab? Um, you, are you going to use a splitter at the same soil gas port, or? Yes, I think I had a photo on that earlier, and okay. um, you can you can have one one tube coming out of the port like this, and then branching off into two separate flow controllers and SUMA canisters. Alternatively, you could have the, the port connected to one flow controller and entering into two SUMA canisters after the flow controller. Uh, but I think, I believe this is a more conventional way to do it where um, each SUMA canister has its own flow controller. Okay, um, so we got a couple more. People can hang in there for another minute, a few minutes. Um, how about, if you've got an open lot, but there's a proposal for development, how would you how would you set up um, an investigation there? Uh, well, um, I, so the question okay. will be once once the building is put on top of that open lot, is is the building foundation now going to act as a as kind of a cap or a barrier where where vapor sub soil gas concentrations can build up under the building. Um, yeah, it's a little so, bit more of a question that I hadn't quite read when I asked it, which is, um, yeah, they want to set cleanup goals for the for the chemicals um, so that it doesn't, yeah, create a problem. So. Yeah. So um, 
in that situation, it's it's that's a good a good candidate for a, a soil gas survey with a focus on deeper soil gas samples. Um, you know, if, if the water table is shallow or something like 10 feet down, um, the soil gas samples could be taken from five to eight feet. If the uh, if the groundwater table is much deeper, uh, you might want to take the soil gas samples um, 10 or 20 feet down. Uh, the deeper you go, the less less variability you're going to have over the long term in the soil gas concentrations. So, um, it, you know, assessing a, a site that's going to be developed is like assessing uh, any site that that might be contaminated. Um, if you have, you know, looking at groundwater data, um, if it's or if 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 groundwater data is not readily available and it's too difficult to install a well. Uh, doing a, a so, an exterior soil gas survey like we showed in, in something like this uh, on the property uh, can be uh, can be informative on of the potential for uh, soil gas uh, uh, presence of VOCs in soil gas and whether they might pose a vapor intrusion risk. But ultimately, uh, many developers, if there's any question at all, it's they they go ahead and put in a, a sub slab. Um, depressurization system. It's often not that much more expensive to build it into the project if there's any question at all. So just take that preventative measure during the construction. Yeah, kind of as a preemptive measure if there's any question. Um, it depends on how big the building is, obviously, but uh, oftentimes taking a, pre a preemptive measure uh, you know, can be can be give you that guarantee that uh, you're not going to have a problem down the road. Okay, um, for soil gas, for those soil gas samples, how many, um, how far apart, how many, uh, how many, what, what time frame are you sampling them over? Do you, do you need to come back a few times and get samples over time to confirm? Um, what? Yeah, so, um, Generally, I and this is generally, I would recommend uh, an exterior soil gas sampling program going um, to, to some depth more than five feet, because as I said earlier, getting data from deeper in the Vado zone is going to be more consistent and less prone to variability. And if you if you have um, the ability to to have direct push or or manual equipment on the site and have a, a real time analyzer on the site, you can you can have a, a, an adaptive investigation going where you look at the results of your soil gas and, and uh, determine where you sample next based on the results that you get in the field. So your, your adaptive investigation focuses on where you might believe there's a hot spot and you move towards that and the, you have the ability to delineate uh, that, uh, that property in, in, re, in near real time by having the combination of, um, of, of of temporary soil gas uh, sampling equipment and um, an on-site uh, screening instruments as well. And you would split a split a portion of those samples with with uh, SUMA canisters and send them off to a fixed lab just to confirm that your your on-site analysis is in the right ballpark. Okay, uh, here's a question that's a little more geared towards next week's webinar that's going to be about mitigation. But um, if you put in a mitigation system, uh, say, preemptively, like you're going to construct some new houses, you put in a system, are those, can those systems all be sort of passive so there isn't any maintenance? Or, or how, do you, um, you know, how do you evaluate the system performance and, and make sure it keeps working? Well, I'll be interested to hear what what the um, the professional installers say next week. But my understanding, from my experience, is that it's not that more expensive to go from a passive system to an active system, and I'm I'm almost guaranteed to to uh, assume that the installers are going to say you you would design for an active system, even if you start off with the system being passive, you want to design the system with the capability to be made active if necessary. And the question of whether you need to make it active is going to 
re rely on sampling, and then it comes down to a question of whether it's worth the cost of continuing continuing to monitor a passive system um, and having to sample a passive system versus just making it active. It's relatively cheap to run a fan and, and not have to sample thereafter. Uh, once you have an active system going, the, really the only monitoring and maintenance that's needed is to make sure that, um, the, that there is a vacuum field under the slab, and that's easily done by installing uh, vacuum monitoring uh, ports in, in the building where it, with, attached to gauges that can be read and alarmed for remote notification if something goes out of whack. I don't know, that sounds a little complicated. <laughs> um, so I just want to point out, I think there's I have one more question to ask, but then also um, a good friend of Namoa um, up in Vermont is uh, pointing out that there's a good source for the common composition of household products at www.whatsinproducts.com. So that's all together, what's, so W-H-A-T-S, inproducts.com. And then there's forward slash chemical, forward slash index. But, um, but I think if you went just to that basic website, you could probably navigate there. So thank you, Hugo, for uh, pointing that out. Um, and then I think the last question, unless anybody else types anything in, is um, just going back, I think, to the Endicott study but or any large site, um, how deep were the soil gas samples collected and how many rounds of samples? Um. Yeah, so um, at Endicott, uh, the, the, the general rule of thumb was to go uh, five to eight feet below ground uh, just to get out of the shallower uh, horizon where there's more potential for uh, dilution with the atmospheric air. Uh, we're really targeting the depth of the basements uh, for the exterior soil gas survey, and I, I would recommend that as a general rule of thumb. And there's some sites where there's going to be shallow groundwater, and you're not going to be able to go eight feet. Um, you know, sites that have slab on grade construction, for example, uh, if if groundwater is very shallow, um, a soil gas investigation might not be might not be appropriate or feasible, and, and you you need to rely on uh, sub slab sampling, but um, before before going there, you, you might want to collect some shallow groundwater samples, water table samples, uh, just to see what's at the top of the water table and what the potential is for off-gassing to the shallow soil gas from the groundwater. Great. So um, it's well after three, so I think we will end there. But I really want to thank Laurent, who started us off. Um, with the interesting sum summary of everything and, and some basics on uh, vapor intrusion and some good insights that he uh, introduced there um, and rules of thumb and that sort of thing. So thank you very much, Laurent. And then thank you to David Shea, uh, who gave this great presentation about assessing uh, vapor intrusion. Uh, both of these presentations, PDFs, will be put on the NAMOA website uh, within the next week or so. Um, and I think with that, we will end. I don't see any more questions coming in. So thank you, everybody who hung in there. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Jennifer. Yes, bye, David. Bye, Laurent. Bye, Jennifer. Thank you.